How's it going? I'm Professor Mark Sheriff, and welcome to my gaming tree. It's great to have you back. I hope you've gotten to see the previous couple episodes. And if you have, you might have been thinking, hey, wait a minute, games are just voluntary participation and then goals, rules, and feedback? That's it? There's nothing else to it? Well, that's the simplified version. So what I want to talk about today is the formal elements of game design, basically taking that basic idea of goals, rules, and feedback, and player, you know, voluntary participation, and actually digging into that a bit more because it's a bit more nuanced. And the reference that I'm going to be talking about is right here. The Game Design Workshop uh, book by Tracy Fullerton from USC. It's a fantastic book. Um, if you are interested in uh, teaching video game design, if you're a professor, um, I, I highly suggest it. Um, if you're a student, I mean, it's, it's, it's really great. Uh, Play-centric version. Um, find it on Amazon, find it, uh, you know, the ebook e copy. But this is, this is the reference I use. This is the textbook I use for my class. And I think it's got a lot of great stuff in there that I think you will uh, find useful. So what do we mean by the formal elements of games? Well, when I was breaking down Mario 1-1 uh, in the previous video, I was going with each action that the player was taking. What, did the, what is the designer trying to communicate about the rules of the game itself? Like, what, what can Mario do? What does the world do? How do you interact? Well, we can actually go a little bit deeper than that, and we're going to actually break it into eight categories now. Players, objectives, procedures, rules, resources, conflict, boundaries, and outcome. So now, instead of just talking about things as just the rules of the game, how do we actually tease that out? So when we first talk about players, we're talking about the player mode of the game. Um, is it a one-player game? Is it a two-player cooperative game? Is it a two-player versus game? Is it a four-player cooperative game? Many games, well, have to have one-player mode. I mean, well, not like a single player, but like to have to pick a mode that players are going to interact. Um, but it's... You, you, you might run into the, the EA Activision sort of mentality of, well, if it doesn't have more than one player mode, uh, it's not worth the time. So this is where you start getting things like extra Call of Duty um, versions where you have a single player campaign plus uh, deathmatch plus all these different modes that you interact with the game. So the first thing you need to think about is how many players? And how are those players going to interact? And once you've determined that, how is the player going to interact with the world itself? Because, for instance, in Final Fantasy, and let's pick an early Final Fantasy for simplicity, there is the overworld, there's a battle scene, there's the status screen, there's very particular screens that their one player is going to interact with. So when we talk about player, we're talking about how, how many players, and how are they going to interact with the game? Then there are objectives. So this is the more generalized notion of goals. There are primary goals, primary objectives, which is the thing that you're trying to do in the game. Your princess is in another castle. Uh, collect all the parts of the Triforce, that sort of thing. But then there are secondary goals, secondary objectives that have become more and more important throughout uh, gaming in the past few years. And most of these take the form of achievements. So uh, anything that's going to increase your gamer score, anything that gives you a little something extra for cosmetics, and you see these achievements appearing in more and more games, even appearing as central parts of the platform of the system itself. The fact that you have a gamer score when uh, the Xbox 360 was released, the PlayStation 3 was released, you know, those trophies, that was a big push for gamification of the game itself. It also might be you're trying to get a high score, or a secondary goal could just be Gathering 100 coins. Gathering 100 coins in a Mario game isn't a primary goal. It's not a primary objective. It's not something you have to do in order to win. But by completing that objective, you are increasing your chance of accomplishing your primary goal. So secondary goals are very, very important because they give intermediate feedback to players as they're going. And then, of course, there's player-driven goals. There are entire genres of games driven around player-driven goals. Animal Crossing, um, basically any art sort of game you can think of, anything where creation is a part of it. Those are going to be really, really important types of goals. So think of some objectives and goal in games that you play, both the primary and the secondary. Um, those objectives could take the play, take the role of capturing something. Maybe you're trying to win a race. Um, you're trying to um, get those Tetris pieces in the exact right position. You know, escape from something, get someone else to break rule. I mean. 
anything that you are trying to do as a part of the game is considered an objective. Now, to accomplish that objective, we're now going to break rules from the previous set of feedback rules um, goals into procedures and rules. So now procedures are going to be the actions that the player takes. Okay, The procedures are going to be when I press A, I jump. Um, when I press up and B in an early Castlevania game, I use a sub weapon. Those are my procedures. Those are the way that I, as a player character, am allowed to interact with the world. The rules define the way those procedures then interact with the world. So when I jump, Mario is allowed to jump a certain height because of the gravity uh, coefficient that's put into the game. Or when Simon Belmont swings his whip um, and it comes in contact with a, with a candle, uh, that candle disappears and an item appears, and that is a rule of the game. That, that is how I'm allowed to interact with it. So there's a ton of nuance here, and we'll do later videos on that as well. But know that we can now break it down to procedures, which are the things that the player can do, and rules, the way that those procedures are interpreted by the game and limited by the game. Resources are anything in the game that holds some sort of value and hopefully have some notion of scarcity. If, if they're not scarce to some degree, then do they really hold value? So resources can be basically anything in the game that matters. It could be health, it could be hearts, it could be coins, it could be weapons, it could be anything. So um, time is another one I've got down there. So in, in most games, um, managing resources is one of the ways that you attempt to accomplish your objectives. So there's some games where literally the only resource you're dealing with is time. So it's can you do something in a, in a certain amount of time and that is it. But if we start expanding beyond that, um, there are games that are completely built around resources. Civilization, um, Settlers of Catan, um, Ticket to Ride, you know, board games definitely are built around the idea of resources. The concept of the German style board game, which are basically resource management systems, uh, Age of Empires, um, any 4X type of game, um, all drive towards how do you manage your resources. So those two, there's two extremes there. But that doesn't mean there's not things in the middle. Super Metroid, um, where you have missiles and super missiles and super bombs, and you have to only use a certain type of resource to get through a certain window, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the resources are those interesting bits of the game where we want to collect them. They're, they're shiny. They, 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 they pop out of things and we want to pick them up um, sometimes. Um, and uh, they're, they're what's going to help guide us toward those objectives. Now, conflict um, could be player versus player, but it could be anything in which there is an opposition to the player character achieving some objective. Um, it could be a bush. <laughs> I mean, it could just be something in your way. So we want to make sure that the conflict, there is some notion of conflict in the game so the player can utilize their procedures within the rules of the game, maybe utilizing some resources in order to overcome those conflicts. This is the definition of the... Um, uh, a game is the, the voluntary attempt at overcoming unnecessary obstacles. It is interesting for humans, for, for, for any player, to take a set of actions that they have and within the rules of a world, be creative in the way they apply those rules in order to accomplish something, in order to show that they can overcome some challenge. So we want to make sure there is something opposing the player, whether it's other players or part of the game or the computer or time or whatever it might be, something that's opposing the player so that the player has the agency to take the procedures that they have and use them in an interesting way. Now, boundaries is basically the agreement that we have moved, that we, are, we have entered the magic circle, that we have suspended disbelief and we are all going to play by the rules. Now, there's a fascinating um, video uh, here for, about the game Johann Sebastian Joust, which you can uh, see the link there and you can pop that in and, and go take a look at it. But the basic idea in that game is that you're trying to knock another player who's holding a motion controller. And there is a socially, hopefully understood rule. You don't walk up to a five-year-old and punch them in the face in order to make them drop the controller. There, there are 
reasonable and acceptable ways in order to play the game, even though there are probably better... Wow, that's a stretch when talking about... Ow. Um, th th to make people actually drop the controller. It, it goes back to my argument in episode zero about I could play basketball by picking up the ball and just walking to the under end of the court and trying to climb up a ladder and put it in the basket, but no one would go for that because I haven't agreed to the set of rules that everyone else is playing by. So the boundaries say that we are all agree to play by these rules. And there has to be an outcome. There has to be something you're working toward. Now, um, this is this is a little different than objective in that that this means that the objectives can be wrapped up in some way. There is something satisfying that tells us that we have completed something. Okay, there has to be something that kind of puts a cap on. It. Um, even a game like Animal Crossing, you, you have that moment when you pay off that final loan to Tom Nook. There is something that that allows you to have some sort of closure in the experience itself. So, with these elements, you can start to Think about how do games get put together and how could you put together a game so that others um, could enjoy it? What are the aspects of a game that, that you think people would enjoy? Now, when you do this, you know, sometimes you're going to start in some of kind of easy. I want to make a one player game. I want to make a two player game. I want to make a, a player versus player game. And hopefully when you come up with your game idea, your primary objective might be easy like i'm going to make a top-down shooter and my objective you know with the player is to get to the end of the level without dying that seems reasonable so that sounds okay great but um you can add on to that as much as you want later but how much should you add on to that um when you start looking at the procedures and the rules and the resources of the game this is where things get tricky what are the actions that you'll allow the player to take? How will the game world respond to those actions? How will you limit or enhance or modify player actions throughout the game? What will your player be allowed to interact with? What things in the world are important? So this is just a subset of questions that you have to deal with as you start working through that, that, that game. In my example of the top-down shooter, can I shoot any enemy? Can I only shoot certain enemies? Do I have to use certain weapons for certain enemies? Do I have to be at a certain power level to shoot certain enemies? Um, there are uh, there's some fascinating shooter games like Einhander, Einhander, where it's it, it's a white black mechanic where if you are one color, you can only shoot the other opposing color, and you have to creatively flip back and forth in order to make through it. This mechanic is used in a few other games as well, but the, the basic idea is. It's a top-down shooter, but I've put an interesting twist on it by changing an interesting rule in the world. And that's what allowed me to uh, create something of my own. So if you're trying to create a game, my suggestion is you try to limit your procedures and rules and resources at first. Focus on a few interesting ways that the player can interact with the game a few interesting ways the game is going to limit the user and if there are going to be any resources involved in that. Once you get a basic idea of how that simple math works first, then you can start saying, okay, that was my first world. Now in this new world, I'm going to add a new twist. I'm going to change a sub weapon. I'm going to change a new interaction pattern. I'm going to riff on a given mechanic. So this way you start with your world one, one. And in your World 1-1, you introduce the player to, you can jump. You can jump on top of things. There are some basic power-ups you can get. And then you start moving forward. Now you're in the sky. Now you're on an ice level. Now you're on a fire level. Now you've changed the things you're allowed to touch. Now there's a button that switches what things are. You can start being creative. But make sure that when you start the game, when you start that tutorial level, introduce the basic procedures introduce the basic rules and the basic resources to your to your users to your players so that they can get an understanding of it before they start doing something more complex don't pitch everything at them at once let them feel out how the game is going to be played so in order to be a good game designer you need to be able to examine games with this in mind so when you're playing your next game i want you to think about what 
are the procedures? What are the rules? What are the resources? What is my player interaction model? What are my objectives? Do I have multiple primary, multiple secondary? You have to be able to separate yourself from the game experience while also still having that game experience at the same time. So do this. Go find two games and take two simple games. Like it can be two simple board games, two simple video games, whatever it might be. And I want you to try to compare and contrast their formal elements. How many players are there? What are their objectives? How are they similar? How are they different? How are the two games um how are the two games related, perhaps? Maybe you're looking at something like two different board games. You're trying to compare Catan and Ticket to Ride. Both are very resource heavy games. Both use cards, both use things on the board. How do those resources affect the way we think about the game? So once you can start experiencing games and thinking about these different components of the games, then you can start figuring out how you can put together your own parts of the game themselves. So thanks for watching. Next time, I think I'll try and go into a few games and talk about some more of these elements and then talk about why we are playing these games. So I hope you're doing well. I hope to see you again next time here at my gaming tree. Bye.